Thank you, Lord, for ministering to us. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that abounds in this place. And, Father, as you minister to our hearts through worship now, speak through your word that we would have a clear understanding of who you are in our life and, and what you've called us um, to do, what you've called us to be as you call us to draw near to you. So this morning, Lord, simply give us ears to hear what your spirit would speak to us, your church. We ask it in Jesus' name and all the saints of God said, Amen. Amen. Well, saints, if you would open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 51. Chapter 51. Now, we concluded this book last Wednesday, um, but we're going to look at this one portion of it this morning. Um, just to draw um, from it, I think it's just a word that God has for us um, as his church. The passage we're looking at this morning, Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 20, simply declares this. You are my battle axe and, the, and weapons of war, for with you I will break the nation in pieces. Now, if in your Bible you have, when you're looking at you are my battle axe, that axe may be in um, italics, and that would be correct. Keep in mind that this term battle axe, usually you determine a portion an understanding of the scripture, the Hebrew, through the context that it comes in. Now, this is the only place that this word is used. So if you look in the Hebrew for battle axe, you're only going to find one place, and that's here in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 20. There is another term that's very close to it, same root, and that's actually found in, in Ezekiel chapter 9. Don't turn there. We'll be looking at that in a moment. But it's actually found in Ezekiel chapter 9. And that's something that's close to it. They refer to it again in the, the New King James as a battle axe. But keep in mind that the term can also be translated. And I like this term better, a battle hammer. I like the battle hammer. And the reason being is this. If you've ever seen what an axe does... Um, an axe will basically cut things asunder. It'll split things in two. But when you take a look at what Jeremiah 20 or Jeremiah 51 verse 20 says, says, you are my battle axe or battle hammer, as I would probably translate it, and weapons of war, for with you I will break the nation in pieces. Do you understand there's a shattering that's going on? Not just a cutting asunder, but a shattering. And that word break literally means to shatter. In fact, he shatters it so much that when you take a look down um, more in this pas passage, it says in verse 26 of Jeremiah 51, and they shall not take from you a stone for a corner that God is so going to crush Babylon that there's not even going to be a stone left that you can set in the corner of your house. It's all going to be literally just tiny bits of rubble. That's what he's going to do to Babylon. And as he's going to do it to Babylon, he says in verse 20, you are my battle axe or you are my battle hammer. Who's he referring to? Well, he's referring to verse 11. At the end of verse 11 here of Jeremiah chapter 51, we see this. Make the arrows bright. And God says, sharpen up the arrows. I don't want them dull. I don't want them rusty. Gather the shields. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the king of the Medes. Now, this is an interesting passage. And for some people, this stumbles them. Um, keep in mind that what we're going to be looking at this morning, before we get into looking at the king of the Medes, is that right now, as Babylon is this mighty conquering nation, it's the enemy of Israel, and the enemy of Israel has taken them captive and are holding them bondage. And what God is trying to do through Jeremiah is he's going to say, listen, I want you to realize that I'm going to bring one who's a mighty, mighty instrument of war that is going to come and is going to conquer and is going to smash the enemy to little tiny pieces. And I think it's important when we take a look at our lives, you know, as, as Israel was being held captive by an enemy, how many people do you know in your life, friends, family, co-workers, that are being held by an enemy that's greater than them? being held by Satan, and they're in bondage to sin. 
And what happens is there's an instrument that God uses to free them. And there's an instrument that he uses to smash the enemy into little bits. And, and of course, we know this is Jesus Christ. But also keep in mind that Jesus is what? He's the word became flesh. And this is what God uses. He used to free me. He used to free you. He used the word of God. And of course, you know that, that, that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And those are the things that will direct us. So if you're praying for people that you see that are in bondage and being held captive by the enemy, I'll tell you what, the word of God, the word of God is powerful and it's able to free. It's able to literally to break the, the chains of the enemy, to break the bondage. And, and so this is what here where we can take out of this as something that, that we can grab a hold of. Because what God declares is that, you know, of course, Jeremiah 51, verse 20, you are my battle axe or battle hammer and the weapons of war. For with you, I will break the nations in pieces. And so he's going to break Babylon in pieces. Now, he does say that in verse 11, make your arrows bright, gather the shields. The Lord has raised up the spear of the king of the Medes. Now, for those of you that are, are history buffs and want to deal with the history of the scriptures, your mind is probably going to go like my mind instantly back into the book of Isaiah. Now, in Isaiah, there's two passages that are side by side, beginning in chapter 48 in Isaiah, verse 28, and then the first two verses of chapter 45. So the last verse of 48, the first two verses of 45, actually make this statement. Isaiah 44, verse 28, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. And he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. And to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. So now we see here that in Isaiah, he says the one who's going to come and conquer Babylon is a man by the name of Cyrus. Now, here's what throws people. Babylon was the first of the world powers spoken of by Daniel. The second of the world powers is going to be the Medo-Persian Empire. It's an empire that is kind of based around the Persians and the Medes. They're, they're, they're neighboring countries, but they would come together. And, but the head of the army would be a man by the name of Cyrus. Now, what's interesting is this. Cyrus was the great king of the Persian Empire, not the Medes. Now, this is what's interesting. When you look at verse 11, that, keep in mind, I'm going to give you five names. And so I'm going to try to, you know, keep these in context. So don't, if you're a note taker, just see me afterwards because I'm probably going to go faster than, than what you, what you can jot this next little portion of, of history down. Cyrus was the king of the great Persian empire. Now, he, he came to power in about 559 B.C., and then eventually they would conquer and capture Babylon in 539 B.C. So 30, 20 years later, after he comes to power, Cyrus of Persia. Now, tradition has it that one of the soldiers that was there in the army of, you know, Cyrus, the king of the Persians, one of the soldiers was a man by the name of Darius, and he was a Mede. Now, what here scholars say is that verse 11 actually talks about one man, one little soldier who all he thinks is what? I'm a soldier. Who am I? What am I? And God says, oh, no, you may just be a soldier now. But what happens is this. When um, Cyrus conquers Babylon in, in about 539 B.C. in October, that what begins to happen is this, that the Darius is going to literally become king 
in 522 BC, 27 years after the conquering of Babylon. And so at this point, keep in mind that Darius is just a soldier. That's what history has him. That's what tradition has him. And they actually have, have him have him as a soldier who's coming into Babylon with this same heart that where God says the Lord has raised up the spirit of the king of Medes as he's just a soldier not even knowing that he's going to be king he enters into the city to conquer it now here's the interesting thing a lot of people are curious to where does that shift of power come between Cyrus and Darius History on this is, is kind of vague, and this is the closest that, when I look at all of history, what I've come up with and what, you know, history backs this up, that when Cyrus conquers Babylon, that he isn't satisfied, that when he wants to go and he wants to conquer more territory, and so he really wants to conquer the, the whole known world. Now, he's conquered Babylon, and then eventually, as he goes out to conquer the rest of the world, he sets up his son, and his son's name is Cambyses II. And Cambyses II is, is a, one of the sons, not the brightest, not the best. And so what we see is this, that the Cambyses, because he is, is not really a, a good king, he wants to kind of ensure his role. Now, he's only a co-regent. Dad Cyrus is still the king, but he's off conquering other lands. So he sets up his son, Cambyses, as a co-regent. Now, what Cambyses does is, um, uniquely, he kills one of his brothers. He kills his brother, and his brother's name is Bardia. And as he kills his brother, because what happens is he doesn't want Bardia to come to the throne. So he kills him. Now, what happens is when he kills his brother Bardia, he doesn't let anyone know. So it's basically a secret. Well, that was a little bit of his, his um, downfall because there was a usurper by the name of um, Gautama. And, and, and Gautama literally pretends to be um, Kamsis' brother, Bardia. He pretends to be the brother because his brother's dead now. And so he pretends to be the brother. He raises up the people. He says, hey, you know what? Camasus is a, is a bad king. Let's go ahead and let's take him out. And the people agree. He's a bad king. We want you to reign in his stead. And so what happens is then, then um, Guatemala kills um, Cambyses. Now, during this time, keep in mind that Darius, who was just a soldier there, was raised up, and, and Darius, when, when the whole thing is going on, he's literally one of the, um, the people who's a guard over Cam Camasus. Now, here's the catch. After um, Gautama becomes king, in about seven days... Um, what happens is this, he only reigns for seven days, and then Darius and some of the other leaders that were there, they assassinate him. So he reigns for seven days, and Darius now steps into that position of being the, the head over the Babylonian Empire. Now, the sad thing is this, Cyrus never comes back from the battle. He never comes back. And so what happens is he has a foolish son. His son kills his brother. Uh, a man that pretends to be the brother kills his son, Cambyses, and then basically then he's assassinated seven days later, and that what is what brings Darius to the, to the kingdom. Because what happens is this, there wasn't any, any great major battle over the, the Mede and the Persian Empire. They were joined, and eventually, just through the course of events, the Cyrus falls off the scene as he goes out to conquer, and Darius is raised up into the place of being a king. So when it says in verse 11... Here in Jeremiah 51, when it says the Lord has raised up the spirit of the king of Medes, he's literally talking about a soldier, a soldier who doesn't even know that God is going to use him for great things. And, and I think sometimes that's a great word for you and for me. How many times do you think, I'm a nobody? I'm just one little soldier in the Lord's army. I <laughs> said, hey, don't worry. Events being what they are, I can make you and use you into becoming a great vessel for my glory, for conquering and bringing out those that the enemy holds captive in his camp. 
And then through the, the weapons and the protection of the Lord, we can go right into the enemy's camp and just, just grab a hold of somebody and walk them right out of the camp. I love that about the Lord. I love that about his word. I love that about his heart. So now that you understand who this is in verse 20, where it says, you are my battle axe and the weapon of war. Speaking of Darius, um, what we see is this. In Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 25, it declares this as Jeremiah speaking, Jeremiah 50, 25, the Lord has opened his armory and has brought out the weapons of his indignation. Keep in mind that God has many weapons. And I think it's important to realize that in the armory of God, there are many weapons many weapons. Now, of course, we're looking at one here is that battle axe or the battle hammer. And as we're looking at that battle axe and the battle hammer, I think it's important, and this is why I would translate it battle hammer. One is because of the shattering, and two is because of that passage that we've covered before in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. Remember as we went through Jeremiah 23, when we got to verse 29, it said this, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. So when you have this battle axe or battle hammer that we're looking at in our text, where Jeremiah says, you know, through the Lord speaking, you are my battle axe and weapons of war, for with you I will break the nations in pieces. He's going to use hear Darius as this this weapon to break and shatter Babylon but understand that there's a lot of high towers there's a lot of high walls that sin and the enemy puts between us and God and I'll tell you what the best way to knock down a wall a big hammer now I have a couple big hammers in my garage I call them the persuader and the persuader's big brother when something doesn't want to move, I grab the persuader. And I'll tell you what, it moves whatever doesn't want to move. It breaks whatever doesn't want to break. And it's interesting that as we see this, this area and we see through Jeremiah that Jeremiah also speaks of another battle hammer. And that battle hammer, of course, that we just read about in chapter 23, verse 29, is his word. His word is a hammer. And his word will break in pieces. Now keep in mind, and I, I find it so amazing, how all of Jeremiah ties into this one portion. Remember now, as his word is a hammer that breaks things into pieces, remember back in Jeremiah chapter 18. And in Jeremiah 18, we were looking so beautifully at that portion of scripture where Jeremiah goes into the potter's house. And there was the potter, and he was doing what? He was working on some clay. And that clay had a flaw. Now, what happens is this, is the, the, the potter just crushes down the clay, and he remakes it into something that's pleasing to him. And it was okay. But in the very next chapter, in Jeremiah chapter 19, Jeremiah tells us of another piece of pottery. This one is not soft. It is not moldable. This one here is hardened. Now, think about it for just a second. If God's word is a hammer, now, two pictures have to go into your mind. The first is a hammer smashing into wet, soft clay. What happens? Gloosh. It doesn't do anything. It just sinks into the clay. Now, you can, you can squish the clay with your, your hand. You can squish it, you know, with, with a hammer. You can squish it however you want. But a hammer going into soft clay doesn't really do any damage to the soft clay any more than the Lord just squishing it and remolding it. But once it's hard, once the clay is hard, what does a hammer do to a hardened piece of clay? Shatters it into pieces. And I think this is what's so amazing when we take a look at what God is trying to say through his word is this, that my word is a hammer. And if your heart is hard, if you are unmovable, if you are unbendable, if you think you're unbreakable, wait till the hammer of God, his word, comes against you. 
And I'll tell you what, you're going to lose every single time and things in your life are going to shatter because you're not willing to bend. But if you're soft and if you're moldable and his word comes, then all the hammer does what? Skloosh. It just, it just mushes right into the soft clay, which is fine. It just gloops in there, and then eventually what? God remakes it. He, he changes it. He does it into something that's pleasing to him. And I think it's so important to realize that what God wants to do is this. He wants your heart soft. And, and his word is going to be that. But what I love about his word is it's when you're hard is when the hammer breaks in pieces. When you're soft, his word just molds and shapes you. And, and this is the beauty of God and the beauty of his word and the beauty of how Jeremiah is just so desperately trying to teach us. Keep your heart soft. Don't harden your heart because when the word comes, it's going to smash some things that you don't want smashed. If you keep your heart soft, yeah, God's going to find flaws and he's going to, you know, kind of squish you down and remake you. But it's, it's something that's pleasing to him. And you want to remain moldable. You want to remain soft. Now, the other portion, remember when we started out, we said that there were two areas in which this term battle axe or battle hammer was used. The first is here, and it's the only time it's ever used is there. The other one is a very close, kind of brought out from the same root. And that was found in Ezekiel chapter 9. Now, if you will, skip over just a couple of books, go to Ezekiel, and as you find yourself in chapter 9, I want to start by reading in verse 9. Now, we won't be in Ezekiel for a while. We're going to be finishing Lamentations on Wednesday for the next Come back to Ezekiel. So it'll be a little while before we come back here, but in Ezekiel chapter 9, it declares this. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice. Now, who's the he? I want to give you context. So the he is going to be found in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. It declares this, And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me, the hand of the Lord God fell upon me. Then I looked, and there was a likeness like the appearance of fire from the appearance of his waist and downward, fire from his waist and upward, like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. And he stretched out the form of a hand, and he took me by the lock of my hair, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the image of jealousy was that provokes to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there like the vision that I saw in the plain. So what we see is this. It's, we understand as we look to Ezekiel, or Ezekiel here, and what we see of John in Revelation, that it's a picture of the pre-incarnate Christ, that God just kind of takes him by the lock of his hair, and he just lifts him up. And as he lifts him up, so this is who the he is. And so in Ezekiel chapter 9, then he, the one who lifted Ezekiel up, giving him the visions, that would be the pre-incarnate Christ, then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe. That is the term, once again. Now, whether it's a battle axe or a battle hammer, it's something that we see here that these six men come. So all of a sudden... The Lord says, all right, I want these men to draw near, those who have charge, each with a deadly weapon. Verse 2, suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. And they went in and they stood beside the bronze altar. 
So these men come and they stand before the altar, the bronze altar that was there for the sacrifices in front of the temple. So you see these men come. They have battle axes. One of them actually is, is clothed a little different. He was clothed with a linen garment, a priestly garment, and he had a writer's inkhorn at his side. So he was like a scribe. And he was there to jot things down. Now verse 4 of Ezekiel chapter 9, And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. He says, I want you, the one who has this writer's inkhorn, I want you to go and I want you to mark the people whose heart is soft and whose heart is grieving from the sin that is being done. He says, I want you to go and I want you to mark them. I want you to mark everyone. And he says this, who sigh and cry over the abominations. And to be honest with you, it's one of those things where how do you view sin? And it's interesting, and I'll, I'll confess it. I, I ask God often to, to make, make my heart not harden because when I watch the news and when I hear what's going on in our nation, I'll tell you what, we become hardened to sin. The other thing is this. Not only do we become hardened to sin, but we, we don't become soft. We don't cry over it. We don't weep over it. We become angry over it. And I think those are two errors. When, when, you, when you see sin and you see someone in bondage to sin, are you angry? Are, are, you, are, you, are you mad? Do you want to break something? Or, or are, are you crushed? Is your heart soft? Remember, when Jesus came to Jerusalem and then he saw the state of the people, he could have just yelled at them. He could have just given them the commandments because he's God. But what did he do? He wept. He wept over Jerusalem. And, and I find it amazing that here, that's a soft heart. But when we look at the sin of the world, we almost become callous to it. Oh, there was another shooting in Milwaukee. Yeah. No, there was another shooting in Milwaukee. The hearts of the people are so hard. Shooting has become just a commonplace. Someone else runs through another red light, kills someone. It just happens again. More drug dealers as they just pass off to the side and they have this thing where their cars are now rolling drug houses. You got someone who parks right outside your house. Another guy pulls up. He walks to the window. He makes a deal, goes back to his car. They both drive off happens in seconds seconds and, and what do we do well we get angry we get mad we get bitter but what happens are you are you broken for the sin and this is the key that, that he says don't be hard and i'll tell you what so often the word of god when my heart gets hard towards sin and it's just one more person doing one more ungodly thing. And my heart gets hard. The God says, listen, I'm going to break that hardness in you, Lowell. I need you to be soft. I need you to weep over the sin. And what happens is the people that just get hard, the people who are, oh, there's another murder. There's another abortion. There's another this. There's, you know, we, we allow gay marriages, all these things that our country does. And we do what? We just simply accept it. It's, let's just move on. Let's just move on. Yeah, there's bathrooms that we have now that, hey, those people that are kind of confused and they don't know, am I male, am I a girl? You know, I can just go into any bathroom I want now. And our country does what? It acquiesces to this. And then we just go right along with it. And I'll tell you what, I think it's important to identify these things as sin, but it's more important not to be angry, not to be bitter, but let God touch your heart and make you soft so you can pray that we can pray with, with a heart of compassion. And this is what we see here. He asked the man with an inkhorn, again in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it, the ones whose hearts are broken because of sin. And then he says this, Verse 5, to the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city, kill, and do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. He said, I want you to go in, 
And I want you to recognize those who have the mark, those who are soft, and those who are hardened, smash them to bits. And it declares this, verse 6, utterly slay the old and the young men, maidens and children of women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. And then he says this, for you Christians, this should be troubling, and begin at my sanctuary. So they begin with the elders who were before the temple. And then he said to them, verse 7, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and they killed in the city. God says, I want you to go and I want you to deal with those who are hard. But he says this, my house first. Don't go out in the city. Deal with my house first. And he deals with the elders, those who were the most prominent people that were there in his house. And as he deals with those who were the most prominent in his house, God says, you've got to deal with my house first. And God does that. He tries to deal with the Christians first. We're so worried about trying to get to other people. And keep in mind, you've got to deal with you first. You've got to let the word of God deal with you first and make sure that your heart is right to begin to deal with others. If you are just angry and if you are just bitter, don't go out and witness. Don't go out and share. Don't go out and be in front of the abortion clinics or don't go out in front of Pride Fest and hang up signs that you're all a bunch of sinners. If you want, go out and weep. Weep over the sin. Weep over those things. Let your heart be soft. They're already in bondage. They're already in with the enemy, and you being angry at them isn't going to help anything. It's going to turn them off and say, wow, the God you serve is angry. Keep in mind, the God that you serve is brokenhearted. That's how Jesus portrays the Father. If you want to see the Father, you've, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen how I've reacted. You've seen how when the people come with this woman who was caught in the act of adultery, and all they wanted to do was what? In anger and frustration, stone her. And I told them, hey, you were without sin. Go ahead, cast the first stone. They all left, one after another, after another, after another, till only Jesus was left. And Jesus said, where are your accusers? She goes, there are none. He goes, neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. He couldn't condemn her. It takes two witnesses. He says, I don't condemn you. But he says this, go and sin no more. He didn't say, oh, just go do your thing. Go, go have another affair. He says, no, no, go and sin no more. The grace of God is what leads man to repentance. And so we see here, and I just find it so amazing that here, it's those things that are hard, that the word of God, like a hammer, tries to break. And the sad thing is this, that we as Christians, we use the word of God like a hammer to try to break those things in our own frustration and our own anger. You have to have a heart that's soft and moldable and shapeable, and then you sigh and cry over the abominations. And then go out, and then as you weep, go to the people. Jeremiah was so incredible in his ministries. He would go, and he, he's called a weeping prophet for a reason. He would look at the state of the people. He would be broken because of their state. He would look at their sin, and he would say, this sin is horrible. But he would look at what the people were going through, and he'd have compassion on the people. And Jeremiah had it right. No wonder that when Jesus would in the Gospel of John, and people say, who do men say that I am? They say, well, some say John the Baptist. Some say, you know, um, Elijah, some one of the prophets, and then they would say this, and some, Jeremiah. Of the four people that Jesus said, who do men say that I am? One of them was Jeremiah the prophet. His heart was soft. He looked at the sin, and he, he said, sin is horrible. But he looked at the people in bondage, and he had compassion on them, except for one group of people, the self-righteous the Pharisees. They were right in their own eyes. They were whitewashed sepulchers. Outside, they looked clean. Inside, dead men's bones. Then Jesus brought the word of God to them, what? As a hammer, beginning in his house. Those who were leaders, those who were the spiritual leaders, he brought the hammer down on them. And I think, be careful, dear Christian, 
When you see sin, how you react to it. And if you react in certain ways like I do, just frustration or, or just a disconnect, because, okay, there's another murder, there's another abortion, there's, there's more, our world is just going down the tubes. Now, how do you look at sin? Does it grieve you? Do you realize that God's heart is grieved because of the state of man? And, and here we see here, God uses these men, puts a mark on those who are soft and says, leave the soft ones alone. But those that are hardened, deal with them. This is here, I think, what's so important and what we can get out of our text. Because here Babylon was what? It was prideful. It was lofty. It was like, who can touch me? And, and when God told Babylon through Jeremiah in 5120, as he was saying that, hey, the, this man who is my battle axe and the weapons of war for with him, I will break in pieces this nation. Oh, my goodness. And Babylon, who could stand against us? We have these walls, these walls that are, you know, 25 feet high, 15 feet thick, walls within walls. They can't bust through there. God says, they're not going to have to. I've given them another doorway. You don't have to try to bust down the walls of the enemy. What do you do? You go into the door. Jesus himself said, what? I'm the door. You just walk right to Christ and you grab their hand. And so where the enemy has all these walls that you can't break through here, God says, I got another door. My son, Jesus Christ, you go through him, you take the hand, you walk out. And we all think we've got to try to break down the walls of the enemy. We don't have to break down the walls of the enemy. I love it because God says through Christ, doors are open. He said it about the veil. The veil that was in the temple ripped in two. He says, now come boldly to the throne of grace. The veil isn't there anymore. And according to God's eyes, just come boldly in. And that's what you can do through the enemy's camp. You go boldly through the door, grab a hold of someone you love, someone that God's put upon your heart, grab on their hand, bring them the word of God. But bring them the word of God in what? In softness, in meekness, in gentleness. And that's the key. If you want, if you're a note taker, just jot this down. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 says, You who are spiritual seek to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness and gentleness, gentleness, lest you also, lest you also be stumbled and turned. And it has to be, if you want to restore, if you want to bring someone back, let it be in that spirit of meekness and gentleness. That's the heart of God. This is what Jeremiah sought to do. And I think it's just so important as we go through to realize that be careful because the battle axes aren't us. We are the ones who weep and cry. God is the one who uses his people and he uses his word as a battle axe. But as long as you're soft and as long as you're, you're, you're meek and as long as you're gentle, your words are not going to be cruel and harsh and break down. Your words are going to be edifying. You know what edifying is? It's building up. It's nurturing. Your words are going to be nurturing and building up. And when you have a hard heart, yes, you've got to deal with the word like a hammer. But when the heart is soft and you bring in the hammer, all you're doing is shloop. I don't know if you've ever taken something hard and just put it into clay or, or you know, when, when you're, it just doesn't work. It just gloops right in. It just, just pulls it right down. And it does no damage at all. And your hammer gets stuck if you swing hard enough. And that happens, I think, so often to Christians. We just use a hammer on a hard that's soft. Listen to the spirit. Are they hard? Are they soft? And I think so often we see that what God wants is this. He wants soft. Now, a couple of verses I want to just bring your attention to so that you can follow the flow of what we're trying to do here this morning. In the book of Psalms, in Psalm chapter 7, beautiful psalm. And what happens is this. In Psalm 7, there's a couple of verses I just want you to look at. And keep in mind, this is a meditation of David. And as he goes through it, two verses I want you to look at in Psalm 7 the two key verses are going to be 12 through 13. But to give you a little bit of context, I'm going to start reading in verse 10. 
But keep in mind, the two main verses are going to be 12 and 13. But it says this in in Psalm 7, verse 10. My defense is of God who saves the upright in heart. So God's going to watch over me. God's going to defend me. Then it says this, verse 11. God is a just judge, and God is angry with the wicked every day. So that's what we see. If he, verse 12, that is the wicked does not turn back, he, that is God, the just judge, will sharpen his sword, he bends his bow and makes it ready, he also prepares for himself instruments of death, he makes his arrows into fiery shafts. So we see that here God uses every weapon he can, he uses the sword, the word of God, he uses here The bow, he uses this instrument of death, the battle axe or the battle hammer. He uses the arrows. And and so, and he turns them into flaming arrows. And this is the Lord. He's not limited to just one kind of weapon. Why? I think it's important to realize that the word of God is able to deal with every type of situation. And you don't always use the same word for um, this, for different people. Keep in mind that when you deal with war, um, if you have a torpedo, you don't send a torpedo after an airplane. Does it make sense? You send a torpedo after a submarine or a boat. You send an, an, a ground air missile after an airplane. Now, you don't send a ground air missile after a submarine. Now, you understand that there's certain weapons that are used in certain contexts. And that's why it's important to be led by the Spirit, because so often we have one or two scriptures that we do, and we always use them for every context. And keep in mind that God's Word is, has multiple uses. It's able to define the very heart and the intent of the heart of every single man. And when you're open to the Spirit, the Spirit will give you a very precise word. Now, sometimes what happens is this. That God, through counsel, will send out what we would call a shotgun blast. It's, it's a bunch of little tiny things, like a message here, to try to affect. And it's a scattering thing for the shotgun. If you ever see a shotgun pattern with birdshot, it, it comes out and it spreads itself over the entirety of a target, which is why most people are bad shots, and they have to use birdshot to shoot ducks and geese that are flying. Because if they shot a 22, they'd be hungry. So it's like, hey, I'm going to use a bird shot. I'm going to use something that'll scatter itself. But there's also this. There's a sharpshooter. A sharpshooter is this. He'll take a single bullet, fire a single shot, and hit his target. And sometimes the word of God is like a message. It's a shotgun blast. We're covering a little bit larger areas, spreading it out over a large group. Other times, it's like a sharpshooter. You sit down with one person... You pray to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit gives you one word, and you share that word. And then you walk away. And you let that, that word do what God intends for it to do. And understand this, his word will not return void. It is going to go forth, it's going to purpose that which he has purposed it to do. And so you just, you, you share that word, you let it be. And I think it's so important to realize, and this is why I wanted you to look with me in that portion in, in Psalm Um, seven because God has multiple weapons and so depends on the situation should depend on the word of God that you use now along with that I want to just give you a couple of verses to to ponder through jot these down because you won't be as fast as I am in second Corinthians chapter 10 jot it down second Corinthians chapter 10 verses three through six second Corinthians 10 three through six simply states this For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons, that's plural, of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And he goes on to say, ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, I want to share this again because what you're going to see is 
I'm not just picking out one passage and trying to make it say something. The passage after passage after passage after passage begins to deal with the same truth. Once again, beginning in verse 3 here, it says, We do not walk in the flesh. Or though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We have a different battle. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And so the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're not man-made, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. They'll pull down, you know, bondage and sin. They'll pull down being blinded by the enemy. His weapon will pull down strongholds, casting down arguments. Those people that come against the word of God, eventually the word of God is going to correct their arguments if they're willing to let the word of God be the final authority by which every thoughts of, of man must be judged. And so casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now what he's talking about this, those who consider themselves too lofty to be taught by the word of God. Oh, I, I, I know that. I don't know how many times where I've, I've talked to people, who go, oh, I know that. Oh, I know that. Oh, I know that. I know that. Well, you may know that, but are you walking that? You can always know these things, but it isn't about knowing things. Knowing just holds you accountable. Walking is what sets you apart before God. And so they have these things where they, they, they think, oh, you know, I know better than what God is trying to say. And then now keep in mind, Lowell, that counsel may work for you, but I'm beyond that. I'm much more mature than that. I don't need that kind of counsel. I need better things than the word of God. <laughs> so, but here he says, this verse 5, casting down the arguments, every high thing that exalts himself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's what? It's bringing you to the door. It's bringing you to him. It's drawing you closer to Christ. And then he says this, verse 6, and this is key. Don't, don't just read it and pass on to it, but it says this being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Don't start hammering people until your walk is right. I don't know how many times, Christians, we judge others. And I'll tell you what, the problem with judging is this, and we've talked about it before, that we have a tendency of judging others, comparing their worst to our best. Here's what you want to do. You want to judge someone, compare them to you at your worst day. Compare them to you when, when, when you're not at your best, and then compare them. Or wait till they have a good day, and then compare them to your own bad day. That's what it's about. And we always want to do what? I'm going to look at the very best day I had, and I'm going to look at your worst day, and I'm going to just look down at you. But that's not here what God is saying. When you're using these weapons and using the word of God, and it's here to do what? It's here to deal with that which is hard, but understand that, that you need to what? Being ready to punish all disobedience when you first, when your obedience is fulfilled. Let the word of God deal with you first. Then when you're all broken because of your sin, then you're not going to be all haughty to judge someone else in their sin, but you're going to come in the spirit of meekness and gentleness. You're going to sigh and cry. Because why? Therefore, the grace of God go I. I know that's who I am. I know that's what I'm capable of. And I don't want to come down on someone all hard. I want to have that soft heart that's moldable and shapeable that, that he's molding me and fixing me. And then if he wants to use me, then, then use me. But I want to be right first. The word of God is for me first and foremost. It's a love letter to God written to me to reveal his heart and my heart, to draw me closer to him. It's not used for me to just, I don't know how many times Christians, they use the word of God as a hammer and beat people with it. No, no. Beat your own head on it with it. That's what you should be doing. You, you need to deal with you first. And this is here what I love how Paul, when he talks to the church in Corinth, you've got to be right. This is a carnal church. They're all pointing fingers at everybody else. No, point the finger at you first. Deal with you first. Then you're going to see clearly. But this is the weapons of our warfare. And it is, it's something that we have to understand. That the word of God is a powerful, powerful tool. But to be honest with you, there's a problem. And the problem's not in the Word of God. 
Keep in mind, the, the Lord said the law is holy, just, and good. The problem is not in the law. The problem is what? In our ability to keep it. And just like the word of God is a great, great tool, the only problem is, is most of us don't know it. It's unfamiliar to us. Remember David when he was going against that mighty behemoth Goliath? And there in 1 Samuel chapter 17, as David was preparing himself to go against that monstrosity of a man, what we see is this. I want to read to you a couple of verses from 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want to begin by reading in verse 37. David himself has already seen Goliath, and he says, man, what's this uncircumcised Philistine doing? And he says, man, just take him out. Who is he? He's, he's, defi- he's going against the, the, he's trying to defile the armies of the living God. And eventually word of David's speech gets to King Saul. And Saul brings David in and David says, hey, listen, I've, I've killed lions. I've killed bears. There was a lion that had a sheep in his mouth and I went and I took the sheep right out of his mouth. I grabbed the lion by the beard and I killed the lion. I'll tell you what, that's a gutsy little David. But what Saul does is this, so incredible. Saul does in verse 37, in 1 Samuel 17, verse 37, Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Now keep in mind that when he talked about the paw of the bear, it wasn't like, not the mama bear, but the pa bear. It wasn't that. He's talking about the, the, the fist. So if you're a mama bear, we understand. But he says, hey, I, I, I was delivered from the, 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 the claw or the paw of the lion, the claw of the pair of the, of the bear, and he will deliver me. He says, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now here's the problem. Saul says, go and the Lord be with you. But then Saul said, yeah, but let me help you out. Let me help out the Lord. Let me help out what God is doing. And so in verse 38, Saul clothed David with his armor. David is now wearing the armor of the king. And he put on a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. And David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. It's interesting that if you really want to be used by God to share the word of God, here's the thing. You've got to be tested by it. You've got to let the word of God deal with you. Let the word of God deal with you in your situations. Let the word of God deal with you when you're angry. Let the word of God deal with you when you're sad. Let the word of God deal with you when you're frustrated. Let the word of God deal with you when you're confused. Let the word deal with you when, what, when, when you're in a sin and you can't get out of it. Let that be what tests you first. And what happens is this, is we go out and we try to use the, the word of God and we haven't let it deal with us. I don't know how many times that someone has come and said, Lo, that was a great message. I need to give it to my cousin. I need to give it to my sister. I need to give it to my neighbor. I need to give it to my brother. I need to give it. And I'm, I'm looking like, what about you? You need to give it to you. I gave it to you. Let it deal with you first. Then give it out. Because what happens is you hear a word of God and you, know, and you, you go use it against someone. And the problem is it's untested. It's untested in you. And here's the thing, the word of God, and I love it how Paul in in 2 Corinthians says, you know, that you can go and you can comfort others with the same comfort wherein you've been comforted. Let the word of God be tested in you first. When you know it's true, then bring the word of God out in the spirit of what? Meekness and gentleness. But David, it's untested. And I'll tell you what, a lot of Christians are untested in this. They have never let the word of God deal with them. They've let other things, or they've used their flesh, or I'm going to stop doing this in my own power, my own might. They've never just surrendered to this word. And here David says, listen, I can't do this. I I haven't tested them. And so what David does is this. He takes them off. He said, "I, I can't use what you use. I've got to use what God gives to me. And this is so powerful. Keep in mind 
that you are in times going to say, wow, that, that word of God that came through Lowell or that word of God that came through my devotions, I can use that because it came to me. I'm aware of this now. I can use this. But what happens is this, is when you always try to use something that God spoke to someone else, I don't know how many times that people, the only thing that they get, they don't read the word of God themselves, but they read a devotion and they read what someone says about the word of God. Now, I don't say that in the negative sense, saying that you can't do that, but what I'm saying is you shouldn't only do that. Because if that's all you're getting is someone else's arm or someone else's stuff, you can't walk because it's never been tested in you. Sometimes put those stuff away and let the word of God just be the word of God. Let it deal with your own heart. Let it work with you. This is what David does. And I love the fact that I got to take off this other man's stuff. I've got to take off Saul's armor. I can't use what God gave to Saul. I have to use what God gave to me. And so in verse 40, then David took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in his shepherd's pouch, which he had, and his string was in, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So David takes off swords, armor, mail, helmets, and he walks out there with a staff, a sling, and five stones in his pouch. Absolutely incredible. That's it. He doesn't say, well, I better get six, better get a dozen, five. That's it. Number of grace. And the interesting thing is this. If you read through scripture, you find out that Goliath had four brothers. Now, I don't know if in the spirit he's like, well, one for Goliath and one for every one of his brothers that come after him. Whether he was thinking that or five was the number of grace or he just chose five at random. I love the fact that what? That's all he had. He had a staff and he had the stones. And amazingly, guess what? He only took one. He just took one. And that's what it takes you know, you have a shotgun blast here, <laughs> five stones. All it needs is one, sharpshooter. And I think when we come to this area and we realize what, what God is, we do see here how the Lord so beautifully and so prominently allow his word, his word to clarify and his word to direct. A couple of passages I just want to close this up with. So don't turn there. I'm way too fast. I already have my Bible marked. So just jot down these next couple verses. I'll give them to you first, then I'll, I'll, I'll read them as, and then if you want, you can turn there, figuring out which ones you want. The first is Hebrews 4.12. The second is Romans 10.17. The third is James 1.21. So Hebrews 4.12, Romans 10.17, James 1.21. The next one is John 6, 63. Now, Hebrews 4, 12. The word of God is what? Living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. And it's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's the word of God. And I think it's so important, the word of God, it's living, it's powerful, it's a weapon. It's sharper than any carnal weapon. It's able to literally, it pierces between the division of the soul and the spirit. That which is me and that which God inputs into me. And I'll tell you what, there has to be a difference because so often we think, what? oh, that's just me. No, 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 you don't understand. By the grace of God, there you go. Nothing good that we do is of ourselves. It's always the grace of God that does the work in us that allows us to do anything good. Because what? The heart is just wicked. Just, just, just wicked. And, and so it, and I love how the word of God just brings it. And, and so when you bring the word of God, keep in mind, it's going to discern, it's going to pierce between the very joints and the marrow. That the marrow is that which actually attaches itself to the bone. The bone is there, and the marrow begins to grow against that bone. And he says, and I'm able to just, where you and I can't discern where one starts and the other one ends. Even in microscopes, they can't. But God says, my word can. That's how fine cutting it is. That, that when you and all your tools can't discern where one starts and where another one ends, he, God says, my word will do that a place that you can't tell the difference, and it's a discerner between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. 
Or, you know, I didn't intend to do that. Well, wait a second. No, keep in mind that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You had thoughts. You have things that are going on whether you intended to or not. You didn't intend to have a go out, but it was there. And, and keep in mind that that's what the word of God does. It pierces right to the very core of the heart. Now, when it comes to this word of God, keep in mind that passage that I second one I gave you, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And, and so keep in mind that it's the word of God that's going to build up the faith. It's going to be the word of God that does the work. That passage, the third one I gave you, was in James chapter 1, verse 21, where James says, hey, lay aside all the filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. And then it says, he says this, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Keep in mind, it's the word of God that's able to save the soul. Not you, not me, not, not our great words, not our great wisdom, not our great love for people. It's, it's, it's when we come with that spirit of meekness and gentleness and we in love give them the word of God. And that word of God, and, and I, I love how, because he says first, where James says what? Lay aside all the things of you. You have to be right. So it it's, it's talks about I'm having to be right, you know, in, in Ezekiel. It talks about me having to be right in 2 Corinthians. It talks about me having to be right first in, in, you know, as we go through James. All these passages says before you go out and you start standing before people and preaching about your righteousness, let the word of God deal with you in your sin. Then you'll go in that right heart of compassion and, and, and go before them. But that's where James 1.21, lay aside all the filthiness and overflow of wickedness and then receive. Then receive with meekness that implanted word. And it has to be implanted. It has to be in you. And in John 6 verse 63, it says, it's a spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And then Jesus said these words, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. That's the heart. It's the word of God that brings life. It's the word of God that's able to save the soul. It's the word of God that is the thoughts and, and, and that is that two-edged um, sword that is the discerner between the thoughts and the intent of, of, of the mind and of the heart. That's the word of God. And if you want to be that person that goes into the enemy's camp, you have to know the word. You have to know your Savior. Keep in mind, like David, he said, I can't do this. It's untested. If you don't know the word and the word hasn't tested you, guess what? You can't do anything. But the other crux is this. If you don't know your Savior, you're in even bigger trouble. Let me read to you a portion of Scripture from the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, it says this. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul, so that even the handkerchiefs or the aprons that were brought from his body to the sick and diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. And in Acts 19, verse 13, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call in the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. I love this. Not by Jesus whom I know, but by Jesus who Paul knows. Now, the amazing thing is this. He says... The evil spirit answered in verse 11 and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to both all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified you got to know your Savior, and you got to know your word. You've got to test it. You've got to let it work in your own heart. And when you know the word, and you know the power of the word, and you've tested the word, you realize one thing. The word of, the God, the word of God overcomes everything. The word of God brings you clarity for each and every situation. I'm going to give you one last passage just to jot it down. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. You know this passage already. It's the very point where Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. And the enemy says, hey, fulfill your flesh. Just fulfill your flesh. Command these stones to, to become bread. 
And the Lord said, what? The word of God says, man shall not eat by bread alone, but by every word of the, of the mouth of God. He quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. The enemy tries to, 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 you know, do him again. He goes, hey, I'll give you everything in the world, all of it. I'll give to you. It's mine. I, I've, I, Adam gave it to me. He, 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 I duped him. It's all mine, all the kingdoms. I'm, I'm the prince of this world. I'm the prince of the power of the air. And he really was. He says, I'll give it. You just fall down and worship me. And then basically he says, listen, you need to get behind me, Satan, because the word of God says this. And he quotes from Deuteronomy 6.13. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God only, and him only shall you serve. I'm not going to take a shortcut to get the world. I'm not going to take a shortcut in the path that God has for me. I'm going to go the road that he has, not the road that the enemy says, here's a shortcut, you can get it quicker. Jesus said, i got to go to glory through the cross. I can't take a shortcut, and I will not take a shortcut. I need to follow the path that God has in store for me. And the enemy always wants us, take a shortcut, take a shortcut. No, you don't have to go through suffering. You, you, can, you can mature just through three easy steps of someone's video. You know, you, you got to go through suffering. You got to let the word of God work in you. You got to test it in your own life first. But no, the enemy says, just use it as a shortcut. Just, it, it worked for Lowell. Lowell said it. it did, you know, just use it on someone else. And I think it's so interesting. Of course, the, the last of what he said is when the enemy comes and he says, hey, Remember now, in the Psalms it says, as he brings them up to the point of the temple, he says, throw yourself off because it's written that the angels will give them charge over you lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, yeah, it was written, but there's a balance to the word. It's also written, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. And so he quotes from, of course, Deuteronomy 6.16. And it's interesting that he always quotes from what? Deuteronomy. It's the, the book is the, of the second law is what Deuteronomy means. He just quotes from one book. And every situation, there's a word. Every situation, there's a word. And when the enemy brings the word and tries to lie to you, the word of God will bring context and clarity to it. There is a battle that is going, and there is just like Israel was in captive to Babylon, and God says, I have a battle hammer that's going to beat the enemy senseless and is going to just destroy his kingdom. And I'm going to set my people, the children of God, free. Know this, dear Christian. You can go through the door and you can go to the enemy's camp. And the word of God will be that hammer which will break the enemy's kingdom to pieces. And then you can take out the children of God. Those that you've been praying for. Those that you've been desiring. But understand, before you go to his kingdom, before you go and you use that hammer, before you do that, let it be tested on you. And know this, know your Savior. Don't say, oh, Jesus whom Lowell preaches. <laughs> Don't do that. He has to be your Jesus. He has to be yours, and you have to know him intimately, intimately be in love with him and let his word become that hammer as we seek to go and free those that we love, the children of God that we've been praying for, from the, the captivity of the enemy. Amen? Father, we do thank you for this word. We thank you for the time that we've had in Jeremiah. And we thank you for this last message that you've given to us. Um, and it's a message of hope. For some of us, it's a message of, oh my goodness, the word of God has to be de dealing with my hardness. Yes, it does. But once we're soft and once it's there, the word of God becomes this incredible hammer. And, and Lord, we, we recognize that your word is going to, as we cling to our Jesus, bring us right into the enemy's camp. And your word is going to take care of him. You already conquered him, Jesus. We know that. But there on the cross that you have disarmed principalities and powers and you've literally made a public spectacle over them. But our victory, any victory is in you and only in you and only in your word because your word is that which is living. Your word is that which is powerful. And your word is that which is sharp. And so we want to be those who have been tested by it and used it in our own lives and know how it works and be familiar with allowing your spirit to give us a sure word for those people that need to hear a word of life and hope of love and forgiveness, of grace. Father, allow your word to just go forth.
allow it to go forth and allow us to be proclaimers of it. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all the saints of God said, Amen. Amen. So, saints, as you are about to go and enjoy this a little extra long weekend, um, hopefully you'll, you'll take this, this passage to heart, and, and as you're praying for certain people, keep in mind, and I think a big thing for us is, Lord, don't let us get hard. Keep us soft. That when you hear the news, take a box of Kleenex with you, you know, and, and try to figure out, Lord, why, why is this going on in our city? Why is this going on in our nation? And, and, and what do you want from me with, with a soft heart? And how can I be in the spirit of meekness and gentleness seeking to restore? And so, Father, let that be our hearts and, and know this, that um, the word of God can take a person just like it took you and me out from the enemy's camp and brought us to that solid, solid foundation, the rock that is Jesus Christ. He can do it with others. But it has to be the right heart in prayer. Why? James says, hey, listen, you, you, you pray and you do not have. Why? Because you pray amiss. You can spend it on your own pleasures, your own desires. And that's why he says you're praying. You're not getting it because you're only wanting it for you. It's like, I want to save this person. I can put another chalk in my Bible. It's like, no, 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 no. If the person is saved, it's for God's kingdom and for his glory and alone. It's not for me. It's not for how good I am or what I can do. It's for God and for his kingdom. And when we can step back on that, because David went after that giant for one reason. He defied, defied the armies of the living God. It's like, who is he? He's nothing. And so he went out with what was tested. He went out in the power of God and the spirit of God, knowing that what? God delivered him from the lion. God delivered him from the bear. And God would deliver him from this giant. Not he would conquer the giant. God would deliver him from the giant. He knew one thing. The battle was the Lord's. That's the battles. Let God use us as his instruments. But keep in mind, keep in mind, hammers for hard, not for soft. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, if we can, if you guys have anything that God has spoken to you through the message, just please come up and, and seek prayer. We're going to have some men and women right up front here to pray for you. And um, lastly is this. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy the fellowship. And so if we could, could we please stand and, and worship our Lord? Praise the Lord.